came to our first conference, at the Lincoln Conference in 1992. I didn't know who he was. I assumed he was at least 80 years old, perhaps older, because uh, I always saw his I always saw his name going to all these conferences, and you would all, you would have to be an established lawyer, retired, to go to all these uh, Lincoln conferences. As it turns out, he wasn't much older than me. And then, as it turns out, we were both freedom fighters. Yes in a foreign adventure abroad, which I won't get into, just because of the sake of time. In between all that, Frank Williams married his wife, Virginia Williams, and her mother, and I get this, because you guys are into southern clans and all that kind of stuff, which uh, you know, I'm not into genealogy. Um, Frank Williams' wife, Virginia, her mother was from Shreveport originally, and a graduate of Bird High School. Yes. Okay. And she becomes a teacher. Uh, uh, Frank Williams' mother-in-law becomes a teacher for like twenty-some years, and his wife Virginia becomes a teacher for twenty-some years. Are you following all this? Okay. And that whole clan came to our first conference and several conferences thereafter. The Williams clan, whatever it's called. Um, and as a result of this, then I have to involve the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities. After we had the 1992 conference, when it was only a two day conference, or not a two day conference, and everybody was saying nobody would come to Shreveport. It's in the swamps. Okay? But they forgot I was here. <laughs> I'm a missionary from the state of Oregon, given up profit and all that kind of stuff that our leftist here is totally against to do missionary work here so that you guys don't sink further in the swamps. Okay, it's been a struggle. I will tell you that. Where am I with this? Uh, okay, and so the LEH uh, sponsored our first summer teacher institute. Frank Williams was at that, and we co-directed that institute. Okay, that was in 1993, and uh, and then Frank Williams and I became friends. And we did not know it at the time, but we made history as well with the the, the Shreveport Bossier teachers who showed up at the institute because that was the first teacher for high school teachers on Lincoln in Team America land. That should send a chill up and down your spine, okay? And it was successful, and we've had, you know, like eight or so after that. And I thank the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities for funding that first institute and several ones after that. Okay, so so there's a connection between your education uh, and the education of the Frank and Virginia Williams and John Larry, who teaches at uh, uh, at Bird High School today with his advanced placement class and does an outstanding job with that, uh, and our speaker. Now, I'm going to reduce our speaker to three lines because he's a walking encyclopedia. You know, if you've heard that term before, he is a walking encyclopedia. Looks a little bit grouchy at times, but that's what happens when you become uh, a walking encyclopedia of the American Civil War. I can only think of two people living walking encyclopedias in regards to the Civil War, and he's one of them. And of the two, uh, I think he has published many more books than the other person. So that's just why he's grouchier looking. Um, and uh, and he, he has this Lincoln dimension to him. You, if you walked down the street, you would not know that he was a walking encyclopedia. Uh, and actually friendly if you talk to him. Okay. Um, his 50 books, very unusual record uh, that he's done. Uh, the most re recent one is Grant and Lee. Uh, it's called Crucible of Command, uh, Grant and Lee, uh, that came out this year. Uh, it's the review that all kinds of, I don't, I've never read a negative review on anything he's done. That's unusual. Uh, because he's 
almost as scientific on cars as an objective as I am. <laughs> but he's a historian and I'm a political scientist. So that's, that's very unusual. So when I asked him to uh, talk down here, since we're the International Lincoln Center, the only one in the world, <coughs> that you said it's chill up and down your spine too. <laughs> if you're getting chilly, that's because of the, all these first things that we do here. When I asked him to talk <coughs> about the global um, legacy of Lincoln, uh, I was expecting him to say, forget it, because I have not written a book on that. I'm not sure about that, but I don't think that. But, you know, I'm used to rejection, because I'm a missionary, remember? <laughs> and automatically, he says yes. And so, <coughs> William Jack B. Davis uh, is going to talk on the age of Lincoln, a global legacy. Thomas Edison, 
devoting Shakespeare to number 11 and didn't even include Churchill in the top 100. Evidence that these man of the, what's it, competitions can be very subjective and often quite chauvinistic. In modern times, almost every new president is dubbed man of the year in his first year. It tends not to last. Had such a popularity contest been waged in 1861, Lincoln certainly would have been voted man of the year, though arguably not in the Confederacy. <laughs> or would he? If such an accolade in 1861 were based on the media interest shown in an individual, which is certainly today's measure, whereby Nobel Prize winners are ranked beneath pointless, inane wastes of calcium and blood plasma like Lindsay Lohan and Paris Hilton. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, what the hell is a Kardashian? <laughs> <laughs> so it sounds to me like a rug. <laughs> the results then, both north and south of Mason and Dixon's line, probably would surprise you. Uh, happily for historians and everybody else interested in research, Millions of pages of American newspapers have now been digitized and they can be searched. The search terms to pull things out of them that you would never find otherwise unless you simply did it the way we all did coming up years in the past in which you went page by page to a newspaper. If, at that, if that was available at that time, it would reveal some very interesting things about opinion, north and south alike. In the nation, I looked at just one of these sites. In the nation as a whole, Lincoln, in a span of papers just for the year 1861, north and south, was mentioned at least 24,000 times in 1861. Look at the other logical contenders for man of the year. Only George B. McClellan seems a, popular, a, a, a possible challenger in the north, but Lincoln's tally was five times greater than his. Other logical contenders might have been Confederates like Jefferson Davis, P.G.T. Beauregard, Robert E. Lee or Thomas J. Stonewall Jackson. Nationwide, <coughs> Davis appeared 10,000 times in those same newspapers, meaning that he beat out McClellan even in the North, but then everybody beat McClellan. <laughs> <laughs> Beauregard is mentioned 3,900 times, Lee only 1,500, and Jackson just over 1,000. Clearly, if you award this fictitious Man of the Year award on the basis of media popularity, Lincoln would be the man by five to two. But look a little deeper. Look, for instance, at the Confederate newspapers. I said he might not be man of the year of the Confederacy. In 1861, for the group of papers represented on this one site, Stonewall Jackson's name appears 100 times. Leeds, 232. Beauregard, 505. And Jefferson Davis beats them all with 734. And Lincoln, 2,665. Admittedly, none of them favorable. <laughs> Look just here in Louisiana. Very few papers from Louisiana have been digitized in this fashion on this one site. Stonewall Jackson's mentioned five times. Lee, 106. Favorite son, Beauregard, 243. Lincoln, 2,328. Eight times the references to all the Confederates combined. This was not the Union's war. It was Lincoln's war. And just as in World War II in Europe, the Allies personified their foe in Adolf Hitler, curiously, in the North, the people rarely spoke of Jeff Davis's war. Instead, <clears throat> no, well, no one did, in fact. But by 1864, it was Robert E. Lee who, in fact, was the Confederate icon in the Confederacy. Jefferson Davis was never really identified with it. But Lincoln, as you can see with some of these thousands of mentions, in the local press, Lincoln is the man who, editors at least, saw his name put before the reading public more than anyone else, even in the would-be nation whose life he was seeking to end. Lincoln simply looms taller than anyone else across the board in 1861. He stood for halting the further spread of slavery, the decisive issue that led to his election, to secession, and to the ultimate outbreak of war. Before the first shot was fired, he defined to North and South and the world the only basis on which any conflict could come about while he was president, and that was overt hostile action by the Confederacy. 
Above all, of course, he held fast to one fixed point. As president, it was not just his desire, but his constitutional mandate and duty to preserve the Union, the whole Union. Thus, by the end of 1861, one paramount fact is apparent and scarcely contestable, North and South alike. Abraham Lincoln was the defining element of the year and the war. Extend this admittedly imprecise sampling across the entire war, 1861 to 65. Lee, in this one site, generates 11,000 mentions. Jefferson Davis, 11,000 mentions. And Lincoln, survey says, 22,422. Lincoln is the man of the war. But of course, that didn't end with his death. More than 16,000 books and articles on him have appeared since. More written about any human in history, except perhaps Napoleon, and I'm not sure I really buy that claim. His name went on the land. He's the only president other than Jefferson, Madison, and Jackson to have a state capital named for him. More than 40 states followed suit with towns and counties named for Lincoln. His name was proposed as a name for two new states that ultimately became Wyoming and North Dakota. I think it would have been wonderful if they both been named Lincoln. <laughs> Think of the confusion. You don't get your mail now if you're in Wyoming. Think about it then. <laughs> Bills were actually introduced in Congress to create two other <coughs> states named Lincoln, one in the Northwest, perhaps for you, Bill, in Oregon, and the other in the South to be carved out of Concord, Texas. How's that for rubbing salt in the wound? Both bills ultimately failed, of course. But Lincoln quickly pressed the bomb, bounds of the United States and began to spring up in other countries, perhaps the first being in Argentina in July 1865, after his assassination, when a new community was named Lincoln. Peoples in America and the world wanted more than just his name on the land. They wanted to see his image. There are well over 300 Lincoln statues in this country alone, from the Lincoln Memorial to Mount Rushmore. And there are at least three in England. I think probably more, including one standing, of course, at London's Parliament Square. Especially in Hispanic America, the identification with Father Abraham took hold. Go to Juarez, Mexico, and you'll see him there as well. Or to Tijuana, where you'll see him symbolically breaking the chains of slavery. And there's another statue in Ecuador, yet another in Santa Domingo. And perhaps most interesting of all, there are three Lincolns in Havana including one in their museum of the revolution. When Cuban rebels rose up against Spain in 1868, Lincoln became for them a hero representing the will to be free. You may have seen Steven Spielberg's wonderful depiction of Lincoln on film. He has been our, indeed, the world's most photogenic president. He's appeared in more than 200 films, more than half of them done in the silent era, where almost universally he's depicted as kindly Father Abraham performing charitable acts, most often freeing a condemned soldier from death before falling asleep on guard duty. He's also the most impersonated American in history, except perhaps for Elvis Presley. And <laughs> one automatically thinks of Lincoln and Presley in the same. <laughs> I have this impression in my mind of Lincoln stepping out of the executive mansion and William Seward announcing, ladies and gentlemen, Abraham has left the building. <laughs> in fact, there is an association of self-styled Lincoln presenters, and they're not all here in the United States. Some years ago, Time Magazine ran a photo that some of you may recall of about 30 of these men, all dressed in full Lincoln regalia, posing for the camera. Most of them were tall and lanky, but some were shorter than I am and shaped like Humpty Dumpty. <laughs> it is very dangerous to tell an American man that he resembles Lincoln. I often get told for my sins that I look either like Ricky Skaggs <laughs> or occasionally Ted Kennedy. I think it's when I'm wearing these that that. But I don't then go out and try to perform bluegrass on the banjo, and I have not to date run for president. I'm the only man in America who's not at the moment. But tell a man, any man, that he looks a little like Lincoln, 
and suddenly he starts standing around holding his coat lapels like this, <laughs> wearing a black broadcloth suit and a stovepipe hat and growing a beard that more often than not makes him look like an Amish farmer. <laughs> <laughs> the mere suggestion of some affinity with Lincoln can bring about profound changes in the personality and self-image of the American male. We see him on our currency, the Lincoln penny, the $5 bill, now on a $1 coin. In 1863, he appeared on the $10 greenback, maybe the only instance, certainly the only instance I know of, in which a living president was depicted on federal currency. We attach his name to consumer goods and services. You can insure your life with the Lincoln National Life Insurance Company. When we were children, we played with Lincoln Logs. Remember when Nixon resigned the presidency in 1974, his successor told the nation, I'm not a Lincoln, I'm a Ford. People around the world have been licking Lincoln for generations. He appeared on postage stamps in San Marino in 1938, Ghana in 1959, Haiti the same year, San Marino the same year, Argentina in 1960, Cameroon in 65, Central Africa, Mauritania, Aden, Antigua, Gambia, Liberia, Liberia, Pulau, Micronesia, St. Kitts, St. Vincent, and that's only a few of the nations that have put Lincoln on their postage. Some of you will be familiar with David Donald's 1956 article, Getting Right with Lincoln, in the Atlantic Magazine. It dealt with how every generation's politicians tried with all their might to get Lincoln on their side, left, right, and center, or somehow to associate themselves with Father Abraham. George W. Bush said on 9-11, they said that 9-11 gave him the greatest challenge ever faced by any president since Lincoln. All presidents will compare themselves to Lincoln. He made his mission accomplished announcement aboard the USS Abraham Lincoln. That was not an accident. Obama is the first president to use the Lincoln Bible for his inauguration since Lincoln used it in 1861. The inauguration organizers have said, have said that Obama's inaugural theme, a new birth of freedom, was inspired by the Gettysburg Address. All, all political parties seem to want it. The compulsion to drape the mantle of Lincoln over a cause long ago jumped the bonds of the new world to find fertile ground in the old. While Lincoln still lived, Karl Marx proclaimed that Lincoln's fight to end slavery was the fight of the working class man everywhere against the tyranny of the oligarchies. In the Spanish Civil War of the 1930s, about 40,000 international volunteers responded to the Spanish Republican government's plea for help. 2,800 of them banded together in what they called the Abraham Lincoln Brigade. In 1959, Fidel Castro came to Washington, and while there he laid a wreath at the Lincoln Memorial, emblematic of his at least effective regard for Lincoln. He remained an admirer, apparently, of Lincoln for the next half century. He kept a bust of Lincoln in his office and wrote that Lincoln was, quote, devoted to the just idea that all citizens are born free and equal. Viva Lincoln, he told his own people. Chinese communists also associated themselves with Lincoln in the People's Republic of China. Abraham Lincoln's stance on national unity during the Civil War and his opposition to slavery have been cited by People's Republic officials, media, and social elites to explain and legitimate their own response to those they disparage as separatists in Taiwan and Tibet. To Beijing, vigorously opposing separatism and preserving Chinese territorial integrity is a cause no less noble than was Abraham Lincoln's resort to war as a way of preventing the secession of southern states. In its quest for more authority, Beijing has recalled the rhetoric and posture of Lincoln toward the Confederacy apparently unaware that it has misconstrued Lincoln's sentiments by citing his words out of context. This resort to Lincoln is not new. Prominent Chinese leaders have manifested a touch of Lincolnophilia since the start of the 20th century. Sun Yat-sen, the forebearer of both the Nationalist Party of Chiang Kai-shek, that was long the ruling party, and the Communist Party of Mao Zedong, explicitly conjured Lincoln as a model for his own national creed, which he called the Three Principles of the People. Sun reportedly wrote that his own three principles, I'm quoting, 
correspond with the principles stated by Abraham Lincoln, government of the people, by the people, for the people, which some translated into the people are to have, the people are to govern, and the people are to enjoy. The apparent link between Sun and Lincoln was enshrined in the first article of the 1947 Constitution of the Republic of China, a document that still remains in effect on Taiwan. It reads, the Republic of China, founded on the three principles of the people, shall be a democratic republic of the people, to be governed by the people, and for the people. Lincoln should be getting paid royalties <laughs> on the use of his words. So established was this putative link between Sun and Lincoln that in 1942, the United States got into the act by putting both of them on a postage stamp together. Later, Chinese Communists also associated themselves with Lincoln. A July 4, 1944 article in the Liberation Daily, the official press organ of their party, proclaimed that the work which we communists are carrying on today is the very same work which was carried on earlier in America by Washington, Jefferson, and Lincoln. Mao Zedong reportedly told a Reuters correspondent in 1945 that a free democratic China would realize the of the people, by the people, for the people concept of Abraham Lincoln. Well, references to Lincoln and particularly to the standard of government that he articulated in Gettysburg, while these references may thread through the political rhetoric of modern China, the effort by leaders of the People's Republic to invoke Lincoln's image and words in support of policy preferences has flourished in recent years. People's Republic leaders refer to Lincoln's posture during the Civil War to immunize themselves from criticism about their own unyielding insistence that Taiwan not be allowed to remain separate and Tibet not be allowed to separate in China. To be sure, the interest in Lincoln waxes and wanes. Former President Jiang Zemin, I'm going to butcher all of these names, who attended an American missionary school near Shanghai, apparently took pride, still takes pride, in his capacity to recite the Gettysburg Address from memory in English. He frequently cited Lincoln to reinforce his view that Beijing has an obligation to defend the unity of China by force if necessary against efforts to divide it. So enamored of Lincoln was Zhang that when Fortune magazine hosted a glitzy conference in Shanghai in 1999, Gerald Levin, who was then president of AOL Time Warner, publicly presented the Chinese president with a bust of the 16th American president. And this goes on and on in Asia. This identification, this effort to link their own time, their own leadership, with our great president. Of course, the other great communist power can't be left out of the Lincoln love-in. On February 14, 1961, Moscow Radio broadcast a tribute to Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln, it said, was a name dear to the heart of the Soviet people. A broadcast beamed at North America and heard here declared that the Soviet people can sympathize with and understand Lincoln's democratic views and his sincere and deep empathy for the working people. Today, when the peoples of all countries see as the main task the struggle to preserve peace, this broadcast went on, we return to the words of Lincoln. Let us strive to do all that will achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. We honor the great president and United States citizen because he represented the revolutionary and dramatic tr democratic traditions of the American people, traditions which found expression during difficult years of the struggle against fascism. Just four years ago, the State Archive of the Russian Federa Federation <coughs> put together a substantial exhibit that later toured, as a matter of fact, titled The Tsar and the President, making comparisons and connections the Tsar who freed the serfs during the Civil War, and Abraham Lincoln. Now, meanwhile, back here in the land of Lincoln, he's also, of course, the demonized poster child of, of the one wing of extremists who tried to compare him to Hitler and Stalin combined. 
He's a favorite of people like Thomas D. Lorenzo, whose books almost manically portray him as a tyrant responsible for the virtual enslavement of Americans today in what some describe as American National Socialism. Consider the current debate on who Lincoln really was. According to one internet pundit, Abraham Lincoln was actually black. His mother came from an Ethiopian tribe and his father was an African American. The story that his father was Thomas Lincoln was just a blind to cover the truth. In fact, Thomas Lincoln, we're told, was sterile as a result of childhood months, and just to make certain, he was also later castrated. <laughs> essentially cut out to be a bachelor. Making it impossible for him to have been anyone's father. In his youth, Lincoln was supposedly nicknamed Abraham Africanus the first. <laughs> no, no, say others. Actually, Lincoln's father was a Mr. Springs of North Carolina, who shortened his name from Springsteen, making the half-Jewish future chief executive's name actually Abraham Springsteen. No wonder the younger generals like Grant refused to call him Mr. President, but addressed him instead as the boss, especially after he tried to rename the Army of the Potomac the East Street Band. For proof of such claims, adherents of the Hebrew Lincoln point to supposed sketches of young Lincoln that show, I'm quoting here, typical Sephardic Jewish looks, dark features, bony skull, lanky build, big nose, craggy brow. Now that Lincoln is beginning to be seen as having Jewish ancestry, what about his status as a Melungeon? Some of you may not know about the Melungeon. Others maintain that he sprang from that uniquely American blend of white Europeans, black Africans, and American Indians that grew up indigenous to Appalachia. Meanwhile, as others argue about his ethnicity, the anti-Catholic esoteric mystical group called Rosicrucians claimed that he was one of them and that he actually sent on their Order of the Lilies Great Council of Three. That would include what that is. But it doesn't matter because really he was French. <laughs> the illegitimate child of a lost son of the lost Dauphin of France. <laughs> well, no, actually Lincoln was a yogi. Not Vera, yogi. He adopted a yogi lifestyle. He dubbed himself a mystic and behaved in a way that corresponds with the teaching of yoga and meditation. There are reports of advanced Hindu yogis doing amazing things, like lifting boulders and heating them, etc. Some would have us believe that Abraham Lincoln, you're talking about how athletic presidents were earlier, Lincoln did the same thing as a young man by lifting and carrying a 600-pound chicken coop, tossing a heckler a dozen feet and more. Lincoln had tapped into what yogis call pranayama, or energy control. Others want him in their embrace. Some gay leaders maintain today that Lincoln, quote, was really what is called a Kinsey Four, a homosexual with more than incidental opposite sex contact. Well, given that he had four sons, I'd say it was something more than incidental. <laughs> <laughs> Most timely of all, perhaps, a new film titled Quran Contemporary Connections announces that, I'm quoting, the 16th president of the United States, Abraham Lincoln, was born a Muslim. Lincoln shares equal footage with luminaries of Islamic history like Saladin, King Faisal of Saudi Arabia, and the former president of the United Arab Republics, Sheikh Zayed. The film's producer says that, I'm quoting, according to the Quran, everybody is born a Muslim. It's only by his own free will that a man chooses a different course for himself in that Abraham Lincoln was not only a born Muslim, but he chose to live by Islamic edicts like abolishing organized slavery, establishing equality on all human beings, democracy and accountability to God and man, core Islamic <coughs> concepts as propounded in the Holy Quran. You'll hear more about other aspects of Lincoln internationally tomorrow. I'm not gonna preempt anybody, but you'll hear more tomorrow about his legacy in Mexico, Israel, and Iran. You know, this, I was originally supposed to be the last speaker. There's nothing worse than being the last speaker on a topic when six others have done it before you. Everybody else takes what you've got left to say. You, you feel like Madonna's next husband on the honeymoon. <laughs> <laughs> you know what to do, but how the hell can you make it interesting? <laughs> Today, there's a website called The Thinking Housewife 
that asks, was Abraham Lincoln a girl? <laughs> Perhaps recalling that several years ago, the tabloid weekly World News carried a headline that proclaimed, and I'm quoting, Abe was a babe. <laughs> which was okay because the same article revealed that Murray Todd Lincoln was actually a man, <laughs> which made some of that incidental sexual contact possible. <laughs> the clothing was a little funny. And as you all know, recently Abraham Lincoln has taken to killing vampires. <laughs> Lincoln can be made useful to almost any, everyone. I haven't yet found any comments on him from the Taliban or Al-Qaeda or ISIS, but don't worry. They will get around to it. <laughs> what will he do next? And where in the world will he be? The great film of the 1950s was titled Viva Zapata. In it, it depicted Mexican failed saddened at the assassination of Zapata, who were comforted then that he was not really gone. Rather, he was all around them, in the wind, in the rain that fed their crops, and in the hearts that kept alive their aspirations <coughs> for freedom. Where they went, so went he. Those are Lincoln wins, too. It's always seemed peculiar to me that Andrew Jackson, a lesser man and I think a lesser president, left his name upon his times. We speak of the age of Jackson, the Jacksonian era. But that hasn't happened with Lincoln. And maybe it's because he managed somehow to escape temporal bonds of his own time to become not just a man of the year or a man of the war, <coughs> but the man of all times. His ideals and values, most of all his humanity, are eternal aspirations that transcend geographical bounds. Almost everyone, everywhere, at some time, wants him for their own because they need him. In the generations ahead, watch emerging nations. If they protest dedication to freedom, to ending slavery, to building nationalistic feeling, inevitably they're going to turn to Lincoln. And so there really is an age of Lincoln. It began in 1861, and we live in it still. Thank you all for watching. Pope Francis visited Philadelphia a few weeks ago. He spoke in front of Independence Hall in the podium that Lincoln used to speak to Gettysburg Address. So there you go. But, uh, after the assassination of JFK, when he lay in state in the Capitol, he lay on the catafalque that had held Lincoln's castle nearly a hundred years before. He's still a resident, and even in the items he's touched in the things that he saw. <coughs> Anybody else? Thanks very much and bon appetit. <laughs> <laughs>